Lightweight Air Ready Masters with AEC and MXF. Oliver Morgan, Metag Metaglue Corporation. Oliver has 35 years experience as an engineer, manager, and technical stra strategist in broadcast television, developing and introducing innovative systems for post-production in North America, Europe, and Japan. Oliver is principal architect of the material exchange format, we know it as MXF, and the advanced authoring format, also known AAF, and the SMPTE metadata registry. He shepherded these technologies through standardizations while serving as chair of the SMPTE Raptor Wrappers, not wrappers, and Metadata Technology Committee. Oliver is a fellow of the SIMTI and holds 10 patents in television and related metadata technologies. Before entering television industry, Oliver studied theoretical physicists at Oxford University. Please welcome Oliver Morgan. Thanks. Good morning. And um, my name is Oliver. I am a metadata addict. Um, uh, today, I'm happy that I have some of my fellow metadata addicts in the audience, in this case, fellow authors on this paper that I'm going to be presenting this morning. Let me find the, uh, the go button, the green one, I'm told. So, as opposed to the earlier papers, which were talking more about next generation systems, I'm focusing today on the practical use of metadata standards for audio channel work within a current production problem. And this current production problem comes out of the PBS, Public Broadcasting Service, need to have a next generation file distribution system, which they call SIX, to their member stations. Um, the context for this is that they need to have reduced bandwidth uh, for um, uh, cost-effective store and forward. Um, if in order to obtain that, they selected the use of AAC audio coding, and we had to go through the process of completing the standardization of that at MXF. And um, then more focus upon production use of audio labeling in order to solve specific production and distribution needs within the PBS network. So this morning I'll be focusing more upon the uh, metadata subjects here. Um, I will be giving you a little bit of uh, information about the MXF specifics for the mapping and the encoding not only of metadata but also of AAC. So PBS wants a standard file format for primary distribution to member stations. They want that to be high quality so that uh, it can survive uh, repurposing and re-encoding. They want low file size to minimize storage for its costs. They desire a standard that is acceptable for wide vendor uptake uh, with sufficient metadata in it to enable the um, production chain, member station, repackaging, and air play out, and also integrate with existing traffic systems. So this is largely focused uh, today upon a 5.1 and a 2.0 um, audio model. Um, so the context for this is the next generation file distribution system to member stations, six cloud distribution. Um, there is of the order of 200 member stations, and when doing a survey of um, the way in which audio channel mapping presently exists and is presently in use within PBS member stations across the US, we found about 40 different distinct ways in which audio channels were mapped into available server channels and to, into um, available playout equipment. Um, PBS also had uh, previous experience with MXF um, and had determined uh, possibly even 10 years ago that the MXF OP1A format is actually a really good distribution format. Um, they documented this originally in the form of the ASO3 specification which focused the MXF OP1A upon um, PBS specific network needs. Um, what we discovered was that ASO3 actually achieved insufficient vendor implementation. And one of the goals in the present activity is to um, get on board with a um, standard that can up, um, attract much more widespread vendor implementation. To, th to, this, uh, to this end, 
um, P uh, PBS has actually engaged fairly closely with the North American Broadcast Association, NABA, and the Digital Production Partnership, DPP, in preparing um, uh, the use of the AS11X standards in order to make sure that we obtain higher vendor buy-in to uh, PBS um, distribution. Um, <clears throat> choice of technologies within the distribution uh, standard. Um, we had previously been using MPEG-2, uh, now moving on to H.264 enables reducing bit rate from 25 megabits for the video down to 15 megabits. Um, this went through considerable subjective and objective tests within PBS headquarters. Uh, we've ended up um, enabling both 8 and 10 bit um, sampling, both 420 and 422 profile. Um, for the um, audio um, distribution, present functionality has been to use eight PCM channels, um, and that uh, means that uh, we've been eating up nine megabits per second on satellite distribution links, which is a real killer in terms of um, bitrate use. Um, this big burden is actually one of the big inhibitors that has meant that to date we, uh, PBS is still distributing mono DVS and mono SAP. Um, a desire is to move to at least stereo DVS and SAP as we move into the six distribution environment. The choice was of AAC um, at low bit rates, so 320 kilobits for the 5.1 and um, 160 kilobits for each of the 2.0 um, channels. Choosing AAC is a, a, a broadly supported open standard and um, it was determined that we got ex uh, excellent quality even with concatenated decompression, recompression, and rerouting. And the actual file format itself, MXF OP1A in the AS11 X9 specification. Um, so regarding audio channel layout, uh, mapping audio channels to specific tracks in files and in servers and in the actual um, baseband plant is a perennial problem. Many, many, many different layouts in use. Um, as I mentioned, PBS member stations, upon survey, we had 40 different varieties. Um, there's been a lot of efforts to try and um, provide standardization of audio channel layouts over the years. Um, what they've typically ton uh, t tended to do is to label well-known configurations. And guess what? There are many well-known configurations. So EBU, for example, lists 53. Um, Sempity, uh, in about three standards, has about 30 um, different standard layouts. Um, and, um, well, you can love standards, but if you have too many of them, you've only got confusion. So um, actually, we reflected this in the early days of MXF by providing a metadata field to put a well-known channel layout. Luckily, it remained relatively unused. Um, this complexity that we have, even at this simple level, um, um, means that we have a lot of human involvement required in packaging, preparation, playout, staging, and uh, quality control. And that adds a big cost burden to, um, uh, uh, specifically in this case, to uh, PBS member stations and their playout operations. Um, we considered making use of the audio metadata that is within the AAC stream itself, but realize that that doesn't provide a sufficient solution. Um, not only will it be focused only upon the AAC understanding of 5.1 or 2.0 or whatever, but at the uh, instant of transcode down to baseband or to other um, emission standards, um, that metadata will just disappear. So a better approach would be to standardize metadata for labeling each channel. And um, this uh, metadata would be put into the MXF file format. Probably, well, it would certainly be KLV encoded um, because MXF is, of course, is totally KLV coded. Um, be independent of the ex um, exact audio codec chosen. It would be persistent across media file formats and databases. And therefore, this channel labeling metadata um, would um, ob, um, achieve a greater utility in audio production and in broadcast programming production. So um, 
this uh, realization came up many, several years ago, and after a lot of work, um, including with uh, my co-chair, um, who's also in the audience, the MCA labeling framework was standardized. This is uh, 7377-4, and uh, we achieved publication of that five years ago. So we're just about to revise it, of course. <laughs> um, I'm also... Um, um, uh, happy to note that the 377-4 labeling framework was enthusiastically adopted for IMF. Um, and now that we are seeing that the broadcast industry or the broadcast distribution industry is, is much more interested in IMF outside the production industry, um, we can expect enthusiastic adoption of MCA within broadcast television as well. Um, also, I would note at this point in time that additional standards and specifications for application areas are in development and active projects and um, um, quite possibly um, we can get um, Mr. Vesa to um, actually invite people to join in those projects um, later on. Um, I know I recently became involved in it in order to bring some broadcast perspective to what had perhaps been more of a, a content creation perspective in the past. Okay, what comes next? So, um, MCA labels and the MCA label framework. So, what do we label? We uh, have audio channel labels. Um, and an audio channel in this uh, context is a set of coordinated samples going to a specific speaker location or a uh, render rendering device. Sound field groups. This is the way in which multiple channels are grouped together. Good examples, 2.0 for stereo, 5.1, and of course, other forms of multi-channel, uh, other multi-channel configurations. And then groups of sound field groups. Groups of sound field groups, uh, a collection of um, uh, one or more program sound field groups, for example, um, a main program, secondary program, the addition of a second language, descriptive video, hearing impaired, and so on and so forth. The way these turn up within the MXF file format, and this is just a little focused view of one place within an MXF file where these channel labels come up, we add MCA labels as these little white blobs onto the existing um, areas of the MXF metadata. And uh, I have a, a slightly bigger view of, this is an anatomically correct view of an MXF file used for uh, content preservation, where um, uh, what was originally one inch videotape has been ingested and the metadata framework has been created and the labeling has been put in place within, um, within the MXF file. And please substitute your own favorite VTR. <laughs> in this space. So in terms of the actual technical design of MCA labels within the framework, um, there is in addition to the, um, the, the basic label structure, there are some parametric and some descriptive metadata fields added. Um, some of it is syntactic information, stuff that is there to, to make the systems work. Some of it is descriptive information. Um, one that is of particular interest at the moment is the content kind or the audio content kind, which today is considered to be a descriptive metadata field. But with the um, effort that is being underway at the moment to produce a controlled vocabulary for this, I would say that audio content kind <coughs> excuse me, could possibly become parametric, that is to say controlled and a very focused metadata in the future. Um, so. Um, Examples of content kind that uh, we're looking at for the, for the vocabulary include um, main program, secondary audio program, descriptive video service, effects composite, music and effects composite, and so on and so on. Um, useful to have those terms used the same way by everybody across application areas. In the PBS case, um, Specifically, the interest is um, on, on the PBS terms of service require a main program and a secondary service. And um, within the main program, there is to be descriptive video as well um, uh, as the, the, the main program mix. 
um, PBS requires to deliver either in 5.1 or in 2.0. We have no requirements at this point in time to deliver both 2.0 and 5.1 simultaneously. But what this leads to is this leads to the um, specification of well-known channels, well-known sound field groups, and specific groups of sound field groups. What I've done on this slide is to show you in the MXF structure how we've labeled individual channels and how we've added the MCA labels that give you those, um, the, the SG and GSG structure. Um, so here is a, a view looking onto a file without any MCA labels on it. And because there's no MCA labels, so there's no information. All you know is you've got eight or 10 channels and you don't know what to do with them. You don't know where to route them. You don't know what's on them which is, um, makes life difficult. Um, by adding the MCA labels, you'd have seen, um, we've actually managed to map the groups of sound field groups and the channel maps and provide that as um, actual active play out metadata. And um, um, let me focus in on, on that and give you some more details. Here we are, an unlabeled channel map. And now we'll add the channel groups of sand, sand field groups, sand field groups, and then the individual channel routing. And so for the first time, you now actually have the ability to have this information on the desktop, put there at the time of ingest, and able to be used for automated routing and QC as you go down the production chain. OK, um, also additional metadata you can add on here. And I've added a little pop-up that says that in the case of um, the main program, 5.1 group, we know what its individual channels are, we know that it belongs to the main program, and we know that in this case it is US English. So it's a second audio program, typically in the US would be um, ESMX, or it may be FRCA for uh, Quebecois French. Okay. Um, so the MCA labels, really good contribution into um, the utility within the primary distribution, repackaging, and playout. Um, we did need to um, spend some time working on the wrapping of AAC itself. Um, MXF wrapping of AAC, at the time that we started this project, was not yet standardized. Um, and there was one very significant issue which was understood at the time, which is that when AAC coding first was popularized, it was popularized largely in an MPEG transport stream environment where it didn't really matter to people that it wasn't the same frame rate as video because the interleaving and the multiplexing could just cope with that. But in an MXF production environment, that package duration difference was a really difficult problem. Um, um, actually, for a while, um, um, I advised, I said, no, don't go there, don't go there. There's, there's, there's too much uh, deployment difficulty in using AAC in a production environment. But I was convinced that reduced bit rate actually makes it worthwhile to make this effort. So the reduced bit rate reduction amounts to a, a, about a savings of about, about four gigabytes per hour of programming. And if you've got to now, because you're doing cloud distribution, you've got to distribute that 200 times rather than just once on the satellite. That's actually quite a lot of money that you don't have to pay to Amazon. OK. Where's the next button? There we go. Um, so there's this uh, issue with synchronization of AAC packet duration. I've got a picture of this coming up in a minute. As it turns out, MXF already included a potential solution for this which we put there as early as 2003. Um, and so it has been lying fallow. It was untested until this year, in effect. Um, so that was, gave rise to the, the, the questions of, is it worthwhile doing this? Um, the mechanism inside the MXF file itself is called position offset tables. And that allows you to establish methods of achieving perfect lip sync, even with varying packet duration. But questions were there. Can, can we prove this technology, this 15-year-old technology, sufficiently for widespread use? 
Can we keep this optional so that existing decoders don't have to be retrofitted with it? And can this mechanism of position offset tables survive splicing, editing, and cutting um, um, at the time of doing um, um, insertion for um, actual playout? Um, so we put a lot of effort into this and um, got a, a tremendous assistance from the SEMPTI Technology Committee and discovered that the answer is yes. So here is a view of what the interior of an MXF file looks like that's got a mixture of AAC and uh, video frames and you see how the packets stretch out and how sometimes you have one audio packet, sometimes you have zero. Um, in other cases with different frame rate combinations, you may actually have two audio packets corresponding to a single video frame. Um, very difficult to get your head around that if you're a decoder. So there is a metadata mechanism put into MXF called a position offset table. And what this does is this calculates the sequence that it takes to actually get properly synchronized, lip synced um, audio packets and gives you on a per frame basis um, the actual offset um, to, from uh, real time to the start of the, of the audio samples upon playout. Also, we're able to retain this as a completely optional um, addition to the MXF metadata. An existing decoder can still play out. What an existing decoder will um, suffer is a, a lip sync offset of perhaps up to one frame. Um, and uh, it will never get worse than that. But if you want to get more precise than that, the um, um, interpretation of the POS offset tables now is very um, firmly specified and um, regularized. In fact, in order to make sure that this was the case, um, we made development tools available. Um, had um, tremendous in-depth technical anal analysis of um, the, the, the meaning and the interpretation of the POS offset tables. I think I had a team at one point of about six experts who were poring over these spreadsheets. Um, the goal was to produce very detailed guidance, and in fact, what we ended up doing was we ended up creating a tool which is part of the standard and is available to, ve to developers to actually show them how to experiment with and prove the use of POS offset tables. Um, also, in order to um, um, uh, guarantee the um, um, availability of the standard, we've produced sample files that have full POS offset tables in them and using actual real program material. I can't show it to you this morning because I couldn't get my projector projection to work, but uh, if you would like to come and see some of that, I do have a booth on the um, other corner of the show floor, and I'd be happy to talk to you um, after this session. Um, <clears throat> what this ended up doing for us was that the carriage of AAC and MXF was published as ST381-4 earlier on this year, including this spreadsheet information and the mapping for the POS offset tables. The channel labeling that I explained to you earlier on in the presentation is actually being published through the um, uh, neighbor DPP um, as um, AS11X9. That will find its way into, um, eventually, will find its way into the broadcast applications of IMF as well. <coughs> Excuse me. So my, my conclusions was what we achieved was uh, file size reduction, precise synchronization of this slightly strange AAC audio packet size, uh, inserted useful metadata into the stream, um, and that useful metadata actually conforms to the full MXF standards and the existing pre-published standards and is offered as a basis for um, um, additional work as we move into object-based audio moving forward in the future. Um, the presence of this metadata within the content enables automated channel routing and actually enables automation of quality control so we don't need earballs to go along with the eyeballs anymore. Um, I think that's all I wrote. So thank you very much and any questions I'd be happy to answer. Thank you very much, Oliver. Do we have any questions? I have a question. Hmm. Um, 
it's been mentioned several times about registries and whatever. And you, in your bio, you, you pioneered the Synthi registry. How, how is that going? How is that working for our industry right now? Um, in a very much better way. Um, I think that what happened, I mean, it was first put in place, the Synthi registry was put in place in, actually in about 1999. Mm -hmm. um, and I think people weren't ready for it. And there was a lot of fear about uh, maybe it was too much opening the kimono. Um, over the last year or two, um, with new presentation tools available for the registry content, new understanding and rationalization of the method of doing registration, and new tools available for that, and new demand. Actually, the uptake of the SEMTI registry is um, accelerating at this point in time. And um, I am happy that um, I'm now seeing maybe 20 or 30 new registration requests, of groups of requests come in every quarter, which is a, a, a real significant action activity. So you're basically telling us metadata is here to stay? Ah, yes, it is, yes. Whether or not you are addict, addicted to it. Please uh, announce who you are. Robert Blight with Fraunhofer. I was just curious, you uh, mentioned several uh, coding of uh, channel essence types, several acronyms you've put up on the screen. Uh, any ideas about uh, liaison with MPEG or ITU on standardizing those content kind descriptions? Um, what I must do in this case is I must de defer to my colleague, Mr. Vessa, who is actually uh, spearheading the activity to um, uh, decide um, that controlled vocabulary, which I would imagine would become a SEMPTI registered vocabulary. And I would sincerely hope that once it reaches that level, it could be um, disseminated widely. And of course, through SEMPTI's ability to be uh, a, a PAS submitter into um, ITU, um, that would be a good route for it to go. In parallel, they have also developed uh, such uh, taxonomies or vocabularies that are, for example, used in the MPEG-H system mm -hmm. today. Okay, okay. so, so um, the nice thing about metadata registries is that the more you register, the better they become. And actually, that was um, one of the in initial understandings of the SEMPTI task force report back in 1997, was that you know everybody's use of Metadata is always subtly different, and so the, uh, it's better to provide a very large dictionary than to try and focus in upon a single standard in, in many cases. But then there are critical application areas where it is understood that, for example, widespread production technology and techniques across an installed base means that there is an accepted <coughs> practice, and that one can be, um, uh, should be adopted as a uh, standardized vocabulary in that space. So this, this conflict between universality and breadth in metadata definition has been a, a, a challenge um, that I've seen many people come at from both directions over the decades. My, my point was uh, we don't want to call it one thing in one standard and another thing in another standard when they are really referring to the same uh, content type. You know, is it, is it video description or is it audio description? Or maybe it's descriptive audio. You see what I mean? No, I, I, I do understand that there is that challenge. Um, I, what I have to do is I have to say that there are well-known application areas where there is a good vocabulary. I mean, everybody, for example, who is in US North American broadcast knows what SAP is. Now, maybe they don't have that same thing in a different geographical area. I don't know. Correct. So uh, these standards are to be used worldwide. That's why I was hoping for coordination between other standards bodies. Well, but that, that requires bodies on airplanes or bodies on the internet. And all, all right, then. I, I, and I would just say I'm happy that you got results with AAC. Mm -hmm. the, these are very similar problems that we addressed with uh, designing the MPEG-H system. Perfect. In order to get the splicing correct. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jim Starzynski, NBCU. Uh, nice presentation, Oliver. Nice to meet you. Jim, thanks for putting this all together for us this morning. Can you flip back a few slides going to the channel order and labeling 
Possibly. Will you have those square blocks up? Yeah, I hope I can. <coughs> am I pressing the right button? Uh, oh, am I? <laughs> oh, no. He's zapping it. <laughs> which one? Which one? That one. Oh, there we go. There we go. All right. Keep going. That one? Yeah, that'll work. Yep. So we look at the channel order here. Mm -hmm. And uh, for us broadcasters working in the current world, yep. totally different. OK. So can you give us an idea where this came from and the, the validation for this? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing. OK. The, the fact I that it goes CLR, to, LSRS. Yeah, we, yeah. we okay. kind of need okay. to understand why this happened. Um, two things. The first is that the mere fact that you have the labels there is good. Right. Okay. The second thing is that because this is an AAC-based um, um, compression sound field group that you're seeing here, and because of the uh, nature of the AAC standards itself actually has a default channel order within that, um, it was judged that the best thing to do was in this case, for this program material, this way, was to actually specify it according to the default um, uh, AAC um, um, center to side, front to back. Um, although I do understand that it's also possible in an AAC stream to um, define um, um, your own different orderings. The fact that I'm presenting it here doesn't mean that this is proposed as a standard specification. It means that the thing which is proposed as useful to everybody is to actually show you that. Okay. Then once you know that your source material, A1, is C, you have the ability to automatically say, yeah, well, I know that in my server that's actually A4. Okay, but this then tells me this was compartmentalized to live in this world, and we won't see this stretching out to other things like NGA or anything as we move forward, because if that's the case, then we've really got to figure out what everybody agrees upon because we've got lots of legacy content that doesn't look like this. Um, Thank you. Wait, wait, wait. I got to step in on this, Jim. I'm sorry. We, we, we did say I got I got to say something here. This is important. So anyway, thank you very much for participating in today's session. Let's give a round of applause to everybody. Thank you.